ceremony. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Anatoly or Tolia, as we used to know him, uh, doesn't need any introduction to, to the physics audience, but since there are so many young, young people around, let me give you a few, few words, a reminder who Tolia Larkin was. Um, so he started his career in the city of Sarov, which you couldn't find in a map until very recently, because that was a city specially built to produce hydrogen bombs. Uh, and he worked uh, directly under supervision of Andrei Sakharov, uh, who then turned uh, a father. What? All right. Um, all right. Th thanks, Boris. Uh, so he, he was working uh, under supervision of Andrei Sakharov, who was a father of uh, Soviet hydrogen bomb, then turned to famous uh, human rights advocate and uh, Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Nobel Prize winner. Uh, so Andrei Sakharov very soon recognized that there is something special about this young guy. And he asked his friend, uh, Arkady Migdal, who at the time finished his work on Soviet atomic bomb and moved to Moscow. And uh, he, he accepted uh, Tolia Larkin as his PhD student. And uh, Tolia was with him uh, until 65, when he moved to newly established Landau Institute for, for theoretical physics, which was his home for nearly 30 years. Uh, and right after that, he moved to, guess where? Uh, Fine Theoretical Physics Institute in, in Minneapolis. And he remained there until 2005, until his untimely death uh, during conference at, in, in, in Aspen. Uh, many of us remember this unfortunate day. Um, let me tell you a few words forward. Yes, no, not this direction that direction, right, uh, about uh, his scientific legacy. So this is one of his very first publications when he was a young PhD student. Uh, so the title is no Unassuming Application of Superconductivity to Problem of Masses of Elementary Particles. Now you can read the abstract while I'm speaking and what you will understand that this paper basically discovered num Nambu mechanism of spontaneous symmetry breaking and Goldstone theorem at the same time. It's actually the same very year where Goldstone uh, pa paper was, was published. Um, so if you look at the back of this uh, student paper, he will tell you, know that, that in the proof, after our work was sent to print, we became aware of the work of Nambu in which analogous results were obtained. Nambu reports of Midwest Conference in Theoretical Physics, our own backyard. By the way, notice uh, that's entire reference list. Uh, just Heisenberg, Gorkov, Zildovich, and Galitsky. That, that's it. Um, so, so this paper of Nambu uh, brought him Nobel Prize in 2008. So uh, Tolia nearly missed this, this Nobel Prize. Uh, that, that was not the last time in his career. His next near miss came in 69. Again, unassuming title, but if you again read the abstract, you will understand that uh, entire theory of renormalization group as we know it was basically spelled out uh, in this paper. So I copied a piece of this paper. So if you ever uh, dealt with renormalization group, you will probably recognize most of these equations. Uh, it's now appearing in, in any textbook. Uh, so Ken Wilson in his Nobel lecture actually mentioned that this paper, along with papers of Kadanov and Pakrovsky, uh, had a pivotal role in his understanding of, of, of renormalization group. All right, I will not go paper by paper, don't worry, because otherwise I would have to go for 400 title. Uh, so let, let me very briefly mention uh, he, his other achievements. In 64, together with his student, uh, Yuri Avchinikov, they discovered 
uh, that condensation is possible with non-zero momentum, which is known as FFLO mechanism. And I guess today uh, colloquium will be heavily based on FFLO ideas. Uh, in 68, uh, he discovered uh, effect of fluctuating superconductivity, namely that you can uh, detect superconductivity at temperature which is above critical temperature. There are plenty of signature of superconductivity even at high temperatures, which is extremely important for experimental uh, feeds and uh, understanding. Uh, in 1970s, he discovered melting of uh, a Brikosov vortex lattice by, by disorder, and that is known as a concept of Larkin length. Again, if you uh, worked ever in disordered system, Larkin length is something completely fundamental to disordered uh, system of vortices. Uh, in 73, with Igor Zelashinsky, they developed theory of one-dimensional thermoliquids, which is now known as a Lattinger liquid, bosonization, and uh, things like that. Uh, uh, 78, char charge density wave pinning done with uh, guess who? Pa Patrick Lee, who will be uh, giving colloquium next week here. Uh, weak localization and sigma model again with Patrick Lee, Al Schuller, Milnitsky, and Ifetov. Anti-localization uh, by Hikami with Hikami and Nagaoza in, in 81. And I could go on and on and on, but but I, I have to give some time to our speaker. So, so uh, I'll skip this. So, so Tolle was uh, extremely famous for, 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 for his student super, supervising. Uh, he didn't have too many students in his 40 plus year career in physics. That's probably entire list, but uh, each one of these people is, is a uh, hero in physics by his own. Um, so Paul Wigman was lecturing here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Igor Alenir and Lev Yoffe are now cornerstone of Google quantum computation effort. Roma Luchin is uh, their counterpart in Microsoft. Um, and you probably know mo most of these names. Um, to, to conclude, my, my personal uh, uh, encounter of Tolia happened uh, in the early 90s, uh, where Tolia brought a group of uh, young colleagues from Landau Institute to, to Israel, where I was, to, to Weizmann Institute, where I was a young PhD student. And that's the very first day of, they, they came to campus. Um, some of you can recognize uh, other people in, 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 on, on this uh, picture. For example, this one is young Alexei Kitaev, who, who, <laughs> who just completed his PhD. All right, so that's that's for uh, Anatoly Larkin. And now we come to the main reason we all are here. Uh, Apparently not uh, So the Anatoly inaugural Anatoly Larkin Award in uh, theoretical physics uh, for early career achievement goes and the Larkin goes to <laughs> Jan Fu. <laughs> Here's our podcast. Man, it's heavy like a bigger thing. It's really heavy. Think about it. Uh, all right. Uh, let me introduce Liang uh, briefly. Uh, so, uh, uh, Liang's uh, path in, in, in size uh, started in uh, USTC, where he, he received his uh, Bachelor of Science in 2004. After that, he moved as a graduate student to uh, University of Pennsylvania, where he worked under with, with Charlie Kane. Uh, from 2009 to 2012, uh, he was a, a Harvard fellow. And he joined MIT in 2012, and he uh, raced through the ranks, and now he's a full professor at, at MIT. Um, 
So this is a list of his awards, which include uh, Hewlett Packard Foundation, uh, Raymond and Beverly Sackler International Prize. Do we still have this prize? Well, Sackler. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, so New Horizon in Physics, the, the, a uh, very prestigious prize. And here we go, Anatoly Larkin Jr. Research Award in Theoretical Physics. And finally, uh, he's a fellow of American Physics Society. Now, I couldn't resist putting his citation index uh, on a screen. So since 2006, when he started publishing, uh, I, I guess this was his first paper. Was it the first paper in his, his PhD? Uh, he has already close to uh, 50,000 citations and uh, age index of 85. So no need to say that his uh, impact and footprint in science was, was, was tremendous. So he is mostly credited for uh, discovery of uh, topological insulators. First, they discovered two-dimensional topological insulators and very soon uh, in this paper, they generalize it to, to three dimension, which is, uh, if you ask me, it's it's one of the most profound discovery in physics in 21st century, probably on par with discovery of gravitational waves and, and Higgs particle. Um, and uh, it was completely unexpected uh, and had a huge impact, for, at least in theoretical physics, uh, in condensed matter physics, but uh, it, it went much beyond that now goes to engineering, optics, uh, sound absorption studies and uh, you, you name it. So he, he then uh, continued his study of topology in physics. He introduced concept of uh, um, crystalline topological insulators, which also had a very, uh, very important follower, following. Uh, lately, he, he started focusing on, on specific materials and uh, invented a brilliant way of uh, telling topology of the materials using some simple band structure calculations, uh, which had huge impact on, on all the experiments which are done in the world for, in, in, in topology. He, he also uh, sp spending lots of time in uh, two-dimensional uh, trans transition metal decalhagenides and I guess tomorrow talk will be mostly about this and Van der Waals super lattices. Uh, by the way, there is a talk tomorrow uh, at 1220 second floor, this building, please come. Um, and um, right, so I probably should sh shut up here. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Liang Fu. Yeah. Great. Some people can hear me. Okay, great. Okay, um, so can people hear me? Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to start by uh, really uh, thanking uh, Alex for introducing me. Uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here and um, I feel uh, very much honored Great honor, also very humbled by this, uh, this uh, locking award uh, for a junior researcher. And uh, of course the honor became even greater when I uh, also learned the senior award uh, went to uh, Patrick Lee. As you know, that he's not only my colleague at MIT, but also my academic grandfather. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a, a really pleasant surprise and a, a great press honor for me to, uh, to receive this award along with Patrick. Um, um, so I never had the uh, fortune of uh, meeting uh, Anatoly uh, Larkin myself, uh, but there is one story uh, I can tell. Um, <clears throat> I first uh, heard of the name uh, Larkin um, from one of uh, Larkin's uh, last students, uh, Chu Shun Tian, and this was in the summer of 2005 when we were both uh, in the, attending the summer school uh, in Boulder, Boulder Summer School. So um, you know, um, Chu Shun uh, told me about uh, uh, Larkin, uh, uh, not only as a leading figure in condensed matter physics, as you heard uh, from Alex, uh, but also uh, as a great uh, teacher and a very kind of uh, person. And uh, um, uh, there's uh, one uh, great piece of uh, advice uh, that I uh, Chu Shen gave me, and I don't know if that came from Larkin himself or not, 
So um, as a beginning, at that time, I was just really uh, beginning the graduate school. This was the beginning of my second year of graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. And I was sort of right at this point of ch uh, choosing academic advisors, PhD advisors. And uh, so I have a lot of free time. And uh, um, Chu Shen told me that uh, um, for graduate students, uh, there's a wonderful textbook uh, called Principles of Condensed Matter Physics. And, uh, and I knew that textbook. I bought it from China when I came to the US for a PhD. But the real great advice you know, that uh, Chu Shen told me is that uh, uh, as a, a beginning student, uh, it will really be uh, useful to do the uh, problems in that textbook. So that the, the real gem of the textbook, according to Chu Shen, is uh, in these uh, problems. And I, I follow that advice, and I spend quite some time, you know, working out all most of the problems in a textbook. And that, in hindsight, that that is a really a, a great experience. Yeah. So um, okay. Um, so um, uh, and then of course, since then, uh, you know, in my um, condensed matter research, I encountered the name uh, Larkin uh, many many times. And uh, uh, and today, uh, you know, this will be uh, reflected in uh, some of my talks today. Okay, so today I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about um, a new quantum property of uh, solid materials, solid state materials. Uh, and uh, uh, so basically it has to do with uh, this electrical uh, IV characteristic. And uh, we will see that uh, even in a uh, uh, homogeneous material without any junctions, uh, the IV characteristic can become uh, nonlinear uh, and also uh, in an interesting way that behave like a, a diode. Uh, so this is what uh, I call a diodic quantum materials. Um, uh, we will see uh, what uh, kind of a quantum uh, mechanical property give rise to this effect. And we will see that uh, this perhaps can lead to uh, novel uh, functionalities. <clears throat> so um, this, before I continue, let me first uh, acknowledge all my uh, collaborators uh, over the years. So um, this work really started uh, in collaboration with uh, a former Papalado Fellow, uh, Inti Sodman, uh, around 2015. And uh, uh, since then, uh, many of my group members uh, joined uh, in this uh, direction. Uh, so the Hiroki Isobe, Yang Zhang, and uh, Noah Yuan are former postdocs. And uh, uh, Michal is a former uh, PhD student. And uh, the recent work is done uh, together with uh, two current students, Margarita Davidova and uh, Yugo Onishi. So, um, so you know, speaking of uh, materials, uh, perhaps one of the most important materials discovered in the 20th century is uh, semiconductor, and uh, uh, this is really the uh, laid the foundation for all the modern electronics, from computation to uh, communication, and uh, um, and uh, the kind of the electronic gadgets we have, like an iPhone, cell phone, is really unthinkable. You know, something like the 50 or 60, 70 years ago, but in terms of the fundamental physics, right? The, uh, the, the building block of these uh, uh, iPhones, uh, the transistors, are pretty much uh, the same uh, as back then. So, um, and the, the uh, key uh, structure uh, in these uh, semiconductor uh, devices is uh, this uh, PN junction. Uh, so uh, if in this, uh, it's shown here. Uh, so if you have a junction between uh, two different types of semiconductors, uh, doped with electron and the hole carriers, then uh, in this uh, in junction region, uh, it creates the so-called depleted region, and uh, there is an intrinsic uh, built-in electric field uh, in, uh, in equilibrium. And uh, this building electric field uh, breaks the symmetry between the left and the right, and it leads to a very interesting uh, IV characteristic. So when you apply a voltage, uh, you get a current. Uh, at the small input uh, current uh, voltage, the current is linear, uh, but then uh, above a certain uh, threshold voltage, the IV curve become uh, strongly nonlinear. And not only is it nonlinear, but it's also an asymmetric with respect to origin. So the resistance is low in the forward direction, but it's high in the, uh, the backward direction. So this kind of a nonlinear and uh, non-reciprocal current voltage characteristic uh, is a, a key uh, functional property of uh, semiconductor junctions. And the semiconductor junctions uh, underlie all modern electronic devices such as diodes, transistors, etc. Please. The blue and the dark neutral. neutral. Okay. Charging in the middle. 
Okay, so this is taken from the website. Thank you, Boris. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so um, um, so um, so you know the uh, the semiconductor uh, junctions are are the um, you know enormously uh, uh, are powerful in all kind of uh, device. Uh, uh, however, there is also a fundamental physical limitation. Uh, so because of the presence of a junction, uh, there's a, a capacitance, and this junction capacitance then leads to a finite uh, time scale for charging and discharging, the so-called RC time. And therefore, uh, the uh, performance of the semiconductor junction uh, deteriorates at high frequency, and uh, uh, there's a so-called uh, intrinsic uh, cutoff frequency. And uh, uh, so the semiconductor junctions basically don't work, work very well at uh, uh, high frequencies. Um, and also the IV curve uh, uh, is strongly nonlinear only above a certain threshold voltage, which is 0.7 electron volts for uh, silicon. So um, uh, on the other hand, uh, nowadays there's a great demand for uh, 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 high frequency and low power electronic uh, applications. And an example, an emerging uh, research uh, frontier is a terahertz uh, frequency range, and uh, um, which is basically a, a thousand uh, gigahertz. One terahertz is a thousand gigahertz. And um, you know, uh, at a high frequency, we can provide a larger bandwidth for wireless communication and therefore uh, faster data speed. Also, the shorter wavelength of terahertz provides a good uh, spatial resolution. So uh, it can be used uh, for uh, imaging and for measuring uh, uh, distance uh, in autonomous driving. Also, the terahertz radiation is non-invasive, uh, so it could be used for uh, biological uh, imaging. So, uh, however, there's a great challenge in developing these uh, terahertz technologies uh, because these uh, semiconductor-based uh, devices uh, do not work well at all at such high uh, frequency. So, this uh, interesting question is, can we think of uh, new physical uh, principles, new mechanisms uh, for these uh, nonlinear electronic devices at such high frequency? So I'm gonna talk about a particular uh, approach uh, we have been thinking for a while. Uh, and this is uh, basically based on uh, intrinsic properties of materials. Uh, so suppose we take a, uh, a ball crystal without any uh, junction, a homogeneous uh, crystal, uh, but it, with a crystal structure that is intrinsically uh, inversion asymmetric. These are called non-central symmetric crystals. And for example, uh, you know, consider uh, as a, a simple example, consider a compound uh, conductor uh, made of two different types of atoms uh, uh, and arranged uh, in this uh, way. Uh, basically, you can think of the system as a, a array of uh, small uh, electric dipoles. And in such a conducting uh, crystal, uh, there is no macroscopic electric field but still inversion symmetry uh, is absent. So then uh, this makes you wonder, uh, you know, according to the uh, sort of the, the teaching of Landau, we should think uh, in terms of a symmetry. So uh, if the crystal structure uh, breaks inversion symmetry, uh, there should be a, uh, in principle, there could be uh, a correction to the uh, Ohm's law. If you look at the IV uh, characteristic, in addition to the linear term, that's the simple Ohm's law, there could be a second order quadratic correction, okay? And if this is present, this means is that the resistance uh, it will be different uh, in the, when you fly, apply voltage in opposite directions. So there's a direction dependent resistance, right? Um, this kind of behavior without any physical junction uh, is sometimes referred to as electrical non-reciprocity. And, uh, uh, and this, uh, if it's present, it will basically leads to a, a diode effect. The resistance depends on the direction of the voltage, uh, yet without invoking any uh, any junction. So again, from the point of view of symmetry, you know, anything that can happen uh, will happen. So 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 we should we should be able to see this. Um, and also, uh, this effect uh, could be uh, useful because it does not invoke any any physical junctions. Uh, this um, response uh, is basically uh, only limited by the scattering intrinsic time scale of, of transport in a homogeneous material, which is basically the scattering rate. Uh, you know, so there is no RC time anymore. Uh, and uh, if you uh, keep working at room temperature, the scattering rate is typically uh, more than 10 terahertz. So this gives us a hope that uh, if you have a, a diodic materials uh, without a junction, 
then it could uh, work at a very high uh, frequency. And uh, uh, so when the uh, input signal uh, is varying on the time scale that is uh, slow compared to this uh, intrinsic uh, scattering time, then we get an instantaneous current voltage relation. And uh, uh, this means, for example, if you have a time dependent uh, input uh, voltage, for example, a cosine omega t, then we get an uh, 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 output uh, current, which contains not only the, uh, the linear response at the same frequency, but also we get uh, from the second order quadratic effect, we get a, a DC component as well as a two omega component, right? So this ability of turning an AC input into a DC output uh, is called a rectification. And this is uh, what a, a PN junction diodes basically do. But here in principle, we can get it uh, without any junction uh, using uh, this kind of uh, diodic materials. So, uh, so there could be all kinds of interesting uh, applications. So, you know, a few years ago, we, we started uh, thinking about this. Um, now, the problem is that most of the materials, if you measure its IV characteristic, it just follows Ohm's law. The correction, uh, you know, is, uh, even, even though it's allowed by symmetry, it's, it's very rarely observed, okay? Uh, now, this is not to say that the IV, nonlinear IV curve has not been seen before. And in fact, you know, I was looking at the literature, um, you know, even more than 70 years ago at Bell Labs, uh, this, uh, this is a measurement of a germanium, a crystal of germanium uh, under the, the IV curve on the high uh, electric field at large uh, voltage. And in this case, you do see there's a deviation from Ohm's law. So nonlinear correction to uh, the electrical transport has long been observed, but it does not show an asymmetry with respect to the direction of the applied voltage. It's nonlinear, but still reciprocal, okay? To get this non-reciprocal behavior, we are looking for a second order correction. And, uh, uh, and that is very rare. And, uh, um, and if we uh, think a little bit more, uh, it ha perhaps has some good reason. Um, so there's a fundamental symmetry, the time reversal symmetry uh, for all non-magnetic materials. And the time reversal symmetry uh, guarantees the energy momentum relation of electrons in the crystal is always symmetric with respect to k equals zero. So the energy of electron at momentum k and minus k are always equal, even when the crystal structure is inversion asymmetric. Okay, so for example, uh, if you look at the uh, electrons in the conduction band of the gallium arsenic, another technologically useful material, uh, you know, the dispersion energy momentum relation is simple, uh, basically quadratic relation, uh, very much like a, a free electron uh, in vacuum. Okay, so this IV curve, again, is symmetric with respect to k equals zero, despite the crystal structure is not inversion symmetric. So, so people thought about uh, ways of to break time reversal symmetry and therefore create this kind of a non-reciprocal electrical uh, response. And this can be done by, for example, applying a magnetic field. And uh, uh, indeed there's a phenomena proposed by theorists about 20 years ago, uh, it's sometimes referred to as a magneto chiral effect. So uh, if you apply a magnetic field, you see that resistance can acquire a uh, correction in the current that's uh, first order. So this leads to a non-reciprocal uh, effect. And this effect has been observed experimentally uh, in a few, uh, you know, a few materials, and uh, including the recent experiment on the topological insider uh, thin films, and uh, the here, uh, the, and I'm showing you the results. Uh, so because of this correction is small, you can uh, measure it by, uh, you can single out the correction to Ohm's law uh, using a, a AC uh, input current and measure the resistance at uh, the frequency two omega uh, because of this frequency conversion that I just mentioned. And uh, so indeed you see that there's a non-reciprocal resistance depends linearly on the current. So it's non-reciprocal. Uh, it also depends linearly on the applied magnetic field. So it's only present when the magnetic field is applied. Okay. Um, however, this a degree of non-reciprocity, okay, uh, um, which is quantified by this dimensionless number, the resistance at uh, uh, forward and backward current, uh, the difference of the two resistance divided by the average is extremely small. Okay. It's less than, you know, one part per 10,000, something like that. And this is perhaps not a surprising thing because uh, you know, when you apply magnetic field, okay, the, uh, in the case of, for example, topological insert surface states, 
the elect magnetic field couples to the electron spin, and there's a strong spin orbit coupling. So therefore, applying a magnetic field leads to a distortion of the uh, electron energy momentum relation. So if you look at the shown here, the dashed line is the constant energy contour of the Fermi surface at zero magnetic field. It's symmetric around k equals zero, but in the presence of a prime magnetic field, it's slightly distorted. So it's an, uh, now an asymmetric. However, the uh, the magnetic field energy associated with the spins, the Zeeman energy, is tiny compared to the typical kinetic energy of electrons uh, in this uh, material, and therefore, unsurprisingly, this uh, non-reciprocal uh, electrical transport uh, is, is a very tiny effect. So this talk, I'm going to basically uh, focus on uh, some recent uh, developments uh, where uh, we now have uh, found, uh, as a community, uh, found that uh, uh, diodic materials with very large uh, non-reciprocal uh, effect. So, um, so one of the uh, recent experiments uh, came from uh, Japan uh, three years ago. Um, so these uh, authors were looking at uh, superconductors. So uh, they created an artificial super lattice uh, made of three layers of different superconducting uh, materials, tantalum, niobium, and vanadium. So this kind of a ABC type of a stacking uh, creates an inversion asymmetric structure. Okay, so the three is the minimum number you need to create inversion breaking uh, in this stacking configuration. Moreover, uh, they measured the IV characteristic in the presence of an applied external magnetic field. So now both time reversal symmetry uh, and inversion symmetry are broken, and uh, um, this material is a superconductor below around you know, 4 Kelvin. Now, interestingly, you notice that uh, uh, at an applied current of 6.6 .6 milliamp, you see that the resistance is zero in one direction, but finite in the other, okay? So this is called the superconducting diode effect. And uh, this creates a very large non-reciprocal effect, right? Resistance is zero in one direction, in the forward direction, but finite, the backward direction. So if you look at this diode coefficient, it reaches 100%. Okay, so this um, this could be uh, could be interesting. Um, and uh, again, uh, so this uh, so since then there has been many many theoretical and experimental papers on this subject. This field is uh, is expanding uh, quickly. And uh, um, so basically, the superconducting diode effect uh, occurs uh, in superconductors or superconducting uh, uh, Johnson junctions. Uh, in which the critical currents in the forward and backward directions are different. And in this case, when the applied current is uh, in, at the intermediate range, we will get 100% diode effect. Okay? Uh, and this obviously requires uh, breaking the symmetries, the spatial inversion, and uh, most likely a time row symmetry as well. Um, and the experiment I just shown you uh, is involving an artificial uh, super lattice. So there's now a lot of interest uh, in finding uh, unconventional superconductors, which by themselves uh, uh, break the symmetry uh, and uh, should lead to uh, intrinsic diode effect. So uh, we, as well as uh, other people, uh, uh, studied uh, this, this problem. And this is where uh, uh, you know, uh, the work of locking uh, came in. And uh, you know, um, as you heard from uh, Alex, uh, uh, locking uh, played uh, an enormous uh, contributions to the field of superconductivity. And uh, one of his uh, lasting uh, legacy is this uh, superconductivity with finite momentum pairing. So let me just remind you that in the conventional superconductor, the electrons uh, pair with zero center mass momentum. You pair states with momentum K and minus K. Spin up electron K, spin down electron minus K, and uh, they pair to give you a Cooper pair with zero center mass momentum. And, and this is, again, a very um, natural consequence uh, because of the Fermi surface itself is K2 minus K symmetric, okay? Um, but Larkin considered uh, uh, the following situation. If you have a metal with a spin imbalance so that the Fermi surface of spin up and spin down electrons are of different size. And in this case, then pairing between spin up and spin down electrons is most natural uh, uh, on the Fermi surface of the two. And uh, there, because of the Fermi surface mismatch, you end up with Cooper pairs at finite uh, momentum. 
So, um, so shown on the left are some schematic phase diagrams. The idea is that if you take a superconductor which has zero spin imbalance at a small or zero or small magnetic field, we get a zero momentum pairing. However, as you increase the external magnetic field, uh, you may get a superconducting state with finite spin imbalance, and that could lead to a finite momentum pairing. So, um, those you know, things, uh, the work of uh, uh, Larkin, theoretical work, there has been an enormous large body of literature, theoretical and experimental, devoted to this subject. Uh, I won't be able to do justice to you know, so it's all, but let me just uh, briefly say that there's so uh, two types of uh, finite momentum pairing. So in one case, uh, you would take a superposition between pairing at the momentum k and q and minus q. And in this case, the pairing order parameter uh, has a spatial modulation in its magnitude. Uh, and uh, but it's still time reversal invariant. Okay, so this preserves inversion and time reversal symmetry. There will be no diode effect. Uh, on the other hand, I'm going to focus on the second possibility that if the pairing only involves a single wave vector q. Uh, in this case, the superconducting uh, order parameter uh, is spatially varying only due to its phase. Its phase changes uh, linearly uh, in space, but the magnitude of the gap stays constant. Okay, so this type of a uh, um, uh, finite momentum pairing is, in some sense, a uh, very uh, I'll say uh, seems very uh, very intriguing because the gap function uh, still stays uh, uh, constant in magnitude, and so it's not quite clear how we can detect this kind of this kind of pairing. So now I'm going to show that basically uh, the diode effect could be a very good way to reveal the existence of this kind of a single. Q finite momentum pairing. So the, uh, here's the schematics. Um, and uh, you know, in such a finite momentum uh, superconductor, we basically have a, a condensate of Cooper pairs. And now the Cooper pairs have a finite uh, momentum and therefore finite condensate uh, uh, velocity. Uh, also, uh, this superconducting state uh, consists of uh, unpaired quality particles uh, because there's a spin imbalance. So there are leftover uh, majority uh, uh, spin electrons that are unpaired, and uh, they also generally have some finite momentum. Okay, so in the equilibrium, uh, the in the ground state, uh, the Cooper pairing has a finite momentum, but there's no uh, net electrical current due to this fundamental uh, block theorem in solid state physics. Uh, in the equilibrium, the ground state has no currents. However, we see that the presence of a finite Cooper pair momentum it breaks the spatial inversion and time reversal symmetry. So this Cooper pair momentum basically plays a role similar to this electric field in the PN junction. Okay, it sets a preferred direction. So in this case, then uh, this uh, based on symmetry, it should allow the a critical current to be uh, in the forward and the backward direction, uh, parallel or anti-parallel to the momentum Q. Uh, these two critical currents in general are now allowed to be different and therefore, this should allow, allow a, um, a superconducting diode effect. So um, again, um, not going to, into all the details, but this can be in demonstrated uh, again using this, uh, this is beautiful uh, James Bolanos approach, which, which I'm always a fan of. And uh, um, for conventional uh, superconductors, uh, if you express the free energy in terms of superconducting order parameter, uh, and uh, you know it consists of basically uh, a quadratic term and the quadratic term uh, involves a constant part, which is uh, set by the, the critical temperature, and it has a q squared part. This is the gradient term, and the coefficient of the uh, gradient term is known as the superfluid stiffness. Just from this free energy, we can find expressions for the uh, critical uh, depairing current, and uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, minimizing the, the free energy uh, and maximizing the critical current. It leads to the conclusion that near the superconducting transition temperature, the maximum critical current is proportional to the reduced temperature to the power of three halves. And indeed, uh, measurements uh, in superconducting films show that uh, uh, you know, in various devices, when you're close to the uh, critical temperature, uh, they do follow this uh, power law behavior with exponent of three halves. So the y-axis uh, is the critical current to the power of three halves. So you see it shows a linear line. Now, um, <clears throat> what is the minimum modification? What we found is basically, if you now think about a finite momentum superconductor, 
um, there's a very simple minimum modification of the genes of Milano theory. Uh, again, uh, at the quadratic level, now the coefficient as a function of the Kubler momentum Q involves uh, a, a much more interesting landscape. So uh, because in the ground state, the supernatting uh, state is the, uh, chooses to have a finite momentum pairing. It means that if you plot this alpha Q as a function of uh, Kubler pair momentum Q, it has a minimum no longer at Q equals zero, but at some finite value, Q naught minus Q naught. And uh, if you are in this finite momentum supernatting states, then we should then uh, look at the behavior of the quadratic coefficient in the vicinity of, of the minimum Q naught. And in this case, uh, you see that in general, uh, there's an asymmetry uh, between the forward direction and the backward direction. Uh, and this is captured by including a simple cubic term uh, in this expression for the quadratic coefficient. And, uh, and this then leads to the fact that the critical current uh, in the forward and backward direction is different. And the difference is proportional to the reduced temperature squared. So it's a very simple uh, 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 so consequence uh, of finite momentum pairing. So it's uh, basically the supernatant diode effect uh, can be used as a direct probe of a finite momentum supernatant state. Um, and uh, um, this is another uh, sort of legacy of uh, Larkin, which is, uh, as you heard from Alex again, uh, that about the supernatant fluctuations. So um, if you look at uh, the state of a supernatant, uh, just slightly above the supernatant transition temperature, and uh, all kinds of uh, 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 interesting uh, phenomena uh, can be found due to the presence of supernatant fluctuations. And that uh, started with the work of uh, Larkin. And this paper uh, says, if you uh, look at the uh, IV characteristic of supernatants, uh, you know, in the presence of magnetic field, there should be a nonlinear correction to the conductivity, nonlinear in a phi-electric field, okay? So, so, um, so this again has been, uh, this is a highly cited work of Larkin. Uh, and, and only in recent years, this experiment from three years ago, I think, that uh, people started to observe uh, not only the nonlinear connectivity, but also non-reciprocal, non-reciprocal uh, effects. And uh, uh, again, this occurs in supernatants uh, that uh, breaks inversion symmetry, non-central symmetric supernatants. So this is a strontium titanate. And uh, uh, here I plot again this uh, magneto chiral coefficient uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, you take a non-crystal material, you apply a magnetic field, and uh, you can look at the non-reciprocal uh, resistance. Um, and uh, you see this coefficient is small uh, at the temperatures far above the supernatant uh, TC when it's away from the supernatant fluctuation region. But as it enters into this supernatant fluctuation regime, you see this uh, uh, non-reciprocal coefficient uh, increases by several orders of magnitude, right? So again, uh, I think this, you know, uh, this, I'm, I'm a newcomer to this, uh, this research area. Uh, I just want to mention it here uh, to show that pretty much uh, uh, there's still a, a lot to be explored uh, when you combine nonlinearity uh, in supernatant fluctuations pioneered by Larkin with, with uh, non-central symmetric crystals uh, with the effect of non-reciprocity. Okay, so now let me move on. Uh, so much, how much time do I have? Thank you. Okay, perfect, yeah. Now let me move on to the, um, the second part of this talk. Um, so far we've discussed basically um, uh, the non-reciprocal diode effect uh, in longitudinal uh, transport. If you uh, apply a voltage, Along the x direction, you measure the current in the same direction. The two terminal resistance shows uh, non reciprocity. Okay. Um, on the, and this, uh, in this case, the maximum diode effect is found in the supernatants uh, when the longitudinal resistance vanishes in one direction. Okay. However, if we think uh, outside the box, um, we can actually achieve an even greater diode effect by going into the transverse uh, direction. If we think about uh, a transverse resistance, okay? Meaning that if I pass current in the X direction, I measure the voltage in the Y direction. The ratio of the two defines the transverse resistance. So unlike the 
longitudinal resistance, which has to be non-negative. The transverse resistance can be either positive or negative. Okay, and this means that uh, if you again look at the diode coefficient, uh, this can actually even exceed a hundred percent. Okay. Um, so um, so to explain sort of how this could possibly happen, the transverse resistance. Let me take a few minutes to go through sort of the long history of the transverse uh, transport uh, in condensed matter physics. So um, this all start started uh, already uh, by the uh, uh, discovery of Hall uh, in the late 19th uh, century. So, uh, so back then, uh, the, he was studying basically conductors in the presence of a applied magnetic field and uh, looking at the transverse uh, response, transverse conductance. So you can see that uh, uh, the transverse, in this case, uh, this is so-called the classical Hall effect. Uh, when you apply a magnetic field, electrons moving uh, uh, in the uh, conductor experiences the Lorentz force, and uh, that pushes electron uh, sideways, and that creates a transverse current, right? So uh, at a small magnetic field, the Hall conductance is linear proportional to the magnetic field, but then uh, you know things become much more interesting when a high magnetic field, and it was found in the 1980s that the uh, Hall conductance actually become uh, quantized into some integer multiples of e squared of h, e is electron charge, and h is Planck constant. So somehow by measuring just the conductance resistance of um, uh, uh, you know in the high magnetic field, one can find something about the fundamental constants of nature. That's quite unusual. Um, and uh, uh, there's another interesting effect uh, about transverse uh, conductance. Uh, this occurs uh, at the zero applied magnetic field. It goes by the name of the anonymous Hall effect. And uh, uh, this occurs basically in uh, magnets, in magnetic material that also spontaneously break time rules of symmetry. And uh, for example, if you look at a material like iron, or in this case, it's a ferromagnetic wild cell metal, uh, and you see that uh, at the low temperature, when the material becomes ferromagnetic, uh, even at the zero applied external magnetic field, the uh, Hall resistance become finite. And uh, it shows characteristic behavior, uh, indicating that the uh, this transverse uh, resistance has something to do with the spontaneous development of magnetization in the sample. Uh, so magnetization uh, basically replaces the role of the external magnetic field. Um, <clears throat> about ten years ago, it was found that uh, uh, in uh, thin films of magnetic doped topological insulators, uh, this spontaneous uh, Hall conductance actually become quantized into, again, multiples of e squared of h uh, at the zero uh, external magnetic field, okay? So, um, so this, um, basically, the, uh, there's a, 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 a long history of studying uh, Hall effect, the transverse conductance uh, in our field. But all these studies are concerned about linear response, linear response. And we see that uh, in all these cases, uh, time rules of symmetry breaking is necessary in order to observe any transverse current. So um, in 2015, um, with uh, Inti Soderman, uh, we started to think about the uh, Hall effect beyond the linear regime. Uh, so what happens uh, when we uh, consider the uh, transverse current at a larger applied uh, electric field? Um, <clears throat> and uh, we uh, found that actually, even in time rules so invariant, meaning non-magnetic materials, uh, as long as the crystal structure breaks inversion symmetry, uh, for example, it have, if it has a polar axis shown uh, with this uh, P uh, here, um, we can actually get a transverse current uh, in the presence of applied uh, uh, voltage. So uh, the voltage is applied on X direction uh, and the uh, a transverse current develops along the polar axis, which is labeled as the Y direction. Again, this is allowed by by symmetry. So the linear response is forbidden, but a quadratic uh, dependence uh, uh, is allowed by symmetry. Okay, so this is why we call it a nonlinear Hall effect. Um, and this kind of IV curve, uh, you know, is, is nothing like anything you've seen uh, before. It's different from the Ohm's law. It's also different from the case of a, of a PN junction diodes. Okay, but uh, we uh, predicted that this should occur in non central symmetric materials. Uh, at the zero magnetic field, this quadratic IV curve. 
Now, if you if you take this IV quadratic IV curve, this is really the most extreme form of non-reciprocal effect, right? As you reverse the direction of the voltage, the current actually stays in the same direction. The current stays the same. And indeed, if you take this formal definition of the diode coefficient, uh, you find that uh, it actually diverges. It exceeds 100% and it diverges. So, um, so how does this effect come from? Okay. Um, so with this, uh, let me uh, say a few words now about uh, where quantum, quantum mechanics comes in. Okay, so um, so far I've been uh, talking about uh, the electron transport based just on the energy momentum relation of electrons in the crystals. Uh, and uh, in the non-magnetic material, as I said, uh, the energy is always an even function of momentum. Uh, so it, it does not show any possibility of uh, non-reciprocal effect. However, um, uh, we also know that the transport properties is not just a property of the energy momentum relation. Uh, it also depends on the electron uh, wave function, uh, which I call psi of k. So um, for electron uh, moving in a crystal, uh, it generally it's a wave packet. It has a central mass momentum k, but also uh, the wave function uh, have a non-trivial structure within a unit cell. So again, back to this example of uh, a binary compound. In general, the uh, electron wave function is a coherent quantum superposition of atomic orbitals on the blue atom and on the red atom. Okay, it's really a coherent superposition. Um, and also the, um, the coefficient alpha and beta, it depends on its central mass momentum. So in this case, when we apply an external electric field, right, by the Newton's law, the center of mass of the wave packet, electron wave packet moves, uh, just as you expect from the Newton's equation. Uh, but at the same time, as the center mass momentum k uh, changes, the way the electron wave function is distributed within the unit cell also changes. So for example, uh, as you accelerate, uh, uh, as the wave vector k accelerated uh, increases with time, the electron wave function may uh, change progressively from sitting on the blue atom into sitting on the red atom. And because of that, uh, there's an a, a anomalous uh, current flow. There's an additional current flow in addition to the center mass motion. Okay, so this effect um, was uh, uh, sort of again discussed a long time ago uh, by Kaplas and Lattinger, and nowadays it's recognized as the uh, perhaps the, the first uh, example of the so-called quantum geometry. Okay, so um, roughly speaking. If we want to keep track of the electron wave packet within a unit cell, so this R uh, intra uh, is the position of the electron within the unit cell. And uh, you know, we know it from quantum mechanics, position is due to the uh, momentum K. So roughly speaking, it involves the derivative of the uh, expectation value of the, of the derivative of the operator with respect to K. And then if you um, further take the time derivative of the, of the center mass of the intra unit cell position, uh, we get this result that there's an additional velocity and this additional velocity is proportional to the rate of change of the center mass momentum K uh, and uh, uh, also proportional to this quantity, uh, which is called the barrier curvature. It's entirely a property of the electron uh, wave function uh, in momentum space. Okay, what's interesting is that this anomalous, so-called anomalous velocity is um, proportional and perpendicular to the electric field, okay? Usually you think about the, about the acceleration being proportional to electric field, but here it's the velocity that itself, which is proportional to the electric field. And also this velocity is always perpendicular to the, the field. So I like to think of this as some sort of a quantum version of the Magnus uh, effect. Uh, if you have a, a rotating ball a moving uh, in the uh, air, it's, it experiences a transverse force. So get pushed sideways. So if you think about the electron wave packet, uh, when the electron wave packet has a non-zero barrier curvature, it means that the electron wave packet is self-rotating, okay, self-rotating. So in this case, when you have apply an electric field, you apply a force, uh, it also acquires a transverse velocity, okay? So because of this um, barrier curvature is entirely a property of the wave function in K space, uh, this is what we call the, the 
the, the quantum geometric property. Okay, you can think of this um, Barry curvature as analogous to the uh, curvature in uh, geometric manifolds, uh, except now we are not dealing with uh, with uh, tangent vectors. We're actually dealing with uh, the Hilbert space formed by the electron uh, wave function itself. So um, um, now, if you um, look at the uh, transverse current, uh, basically we take the enormous velocity and the sum over all occupied states in k-space. So f of k is a distribution function. Um, because the enormous velocity is already linear proportional to the electric field, the uh, transverse current, the whole current, uh, to first order in the E field is already obtained by just using the equilibrium distribution function in the absence of the ex external field. And this leads to the uh, famous uh, formula uh, developed by Thales and collaborators that the linear response uh, tr uh, transverse conductance uh, is obtained by the integral of Barrett curvature over uh, all occupied states in equilibrium. But again, if you have a time reversal invariant uh, material, uh, the energy is an even function of k, the Barrett curvature is an odd function k. So uh, this guarantees then that the uh, integral Barrett curvature over all occupied states in equilibrium necessarily vanishes. So Norm's Hall effect is absent uh, uh, in, in linear response. Uh, however, uh, we went beyond, uh, we consider the nonlinear non response. So we know that if you apply electric field, right? So the leading order effect is to, uh, to, to, to displace the Fermi surface in K-space. So in the absence of the external field, uh, the number of left mover and right moving electrons in a crystal is e equally balanced. There's no net current. But when you apply electric field, uh, we get a current carrying state. Uh, in this current carrying state, there are more electrons moving to the right than to the left. So now in this case, suppose the right moving electrons has positive barrier curvature and the left moving electrons have negative barrier curvature as, as, as dictated by time reversal symmetry, then uh, we will get a non-zero uh, contribution from this this integral, okay? That the barrier curvature the, uh, uh, contributes to a uh, first power of electric field. And then the distribution function is also proportional to first order electric field. That the change of distribution function also is first order electric field. So we get a, a second order uh, effect. We get a, a, a transverse current proportional to apply electric field as second order. So, um, and, uh, uh, and you know, to be more quantitative, one can uh, see uh, with a few lines of algebra that uh, the, uh, at the second order, the transverse current is proportional to this first moment of barrier curvature, right? The derivative barrier curvature with respect to K integrated over all uh, equilibrium uh, occupied states. So this quantity, uh, we call it the barrier curvature dipole. And this is a um, uh, intrinsic material property and it's intrinsically quantum mechanical. It involves uh, the quantum geometry. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, by now people have developed uh, efficient numerical techniques to calculate this barrier curvature. So this formula will allow us to then uh, search for materials that should have this large nonlinear Hall effect, large non-reciprocal response. And uh, the uh, simple uh, model system we proposed back then is that if you take a system of direct fermions, uh, with a finite uh, gap, with a massive direct fermion system. We know that that creates barrier curvature, um, but in order to get a non-zero first moment, uh, to get a dipole, uh, we also require the direct dispersion to be uh, tilted in k-space. This uh, creates a preferred uh, direction. So um, the first uh, experiments on this nonlinear Hall effect uh, came in 2018 from uh, my uh, colleagues at MIT, uh, New Gadig and Pablo. And uh, um, they uh, came up with the idea of that this effect could be present uh, in this atomic thing, uh, crystal tungsten ditellaride. Uh, this crystal uh, has a very low uh, uh, symmetry. It has a polar axis within the AB plane. And uh, also the DFT band stretch calculation shows that uh, the band dispersion at least qualitatively resembles this tilted drag fermion that I just uh, showed you. And uh, this is a, a result of their measurement. Again, to single out the second order response, they applied an AC current, very low frequency of about 100 Hertz, and they uh, locked in to a frequency of two omega. And, uh, and you see that this effect uh, arises when the voltage is measured 
in the transverse direction, in the transverse direction, okay? Um, and uh, the effect is actually quite sizable. So at uh, low temperature, uh, if you look at this quantity called the responsivity, the transverse voltage divided by the amount of absorbed power, this is called the voltage responsivity. Uh, this reaches something like 20,000 volts per watts. And this is actually comparable to commercial PN junction diodes, okay? But except that here is actually a low temperature, so perhaps not useful. So, um, uh, you know, uh, since this 2018 experiment, there are many uh, studies of this nonlinear Hall effect, uh, both in computational, theoretical, and experimental. And uh, uh, with my former postdoc, Yang Zhang, uh, we used, uh, again, the uh, computational uh, methods to study the electronic structure and ferric curvature dipole of various materials. And uh, we found that uh, uh, the wild and metals, uh, this in particular, this niobium phosphorus, uh, it should have a large uh, nonlinear Hall effect. And uh, this is a tetragonal crystal, again, with a polar axis that breaks inversion symmetry. And uh, uh, recently, um, uh, experimental groups at uh, Penn State University, uh, Zhi Qiang Mao, uh, he actually uh, fabricated uh, the niobium phosphorus uh, device uh, using a focus ion beam method. They, they create a very small crystal. Because this nonlinear Hall effect is driven by electric field, if you have a very uh, thin crystals, you can get a large current density and therefore a large electric field. That's why uh, this effect become, uh, become pronounced. So now in this material, uh, the nonlinear Hall effect is observed actually at room temperature. And because the effect is so large, uh, they can just measure direct DC-DC transport, apply DC current and measure DC voltage. So now indeed you see this is raw, raw data uh, and you see the quadratic type of uh, IV, uh, IV curve. Um, and uh, you know, one way to see how big this fat is, is to um, look at the whole angle, okay? When you pass the current, then when the whole transverse voltage develops, the ratio of the transverse and longitudinal voltage defines a uh, so-called high whole angle. So, um, uh, you know, um, in the uh, linear response regime, this uh, whole angle is actually a very small, it's zero, because the material is non-magnetic. But because it's a nonlinear response, the whole angle increases with the input uh, current, okay? So, um, so here, uh, this figure here shows the, the whole angle for various materials. Uh, now, the phosphorus is here in this corner. Uh, it reaches about, uh, at, the, at the input current of one milliamp, the whole angle is already around 40 degrees and it works at room temperature. Uh, and while the other, uh, these, uh, these dots shows the, uh, the linear response anomalous Hall effect, which is present in magnetic materials. And you can see that this now being forces, despite being non-magnetic, it, it, it actually uh, is, is much larger. Um, so um, let me briefly mention one more class of materials, which is very dear to my heart. Um, this is about the topological uh, insulators uh, protected by crystal symmetry, crystalline symmetries. Um, so um, so uh, this, uh, uh, an example is this 4 6 semiconductor thin terawatt. Uh, it has a simple rock saw structure. So, if you look at the surface, uh, you know, it has basically like a, a checkerboard type of uh, a structure with just two types of atoms. So, um, so this type of a topological crystalline insert, it has a surface state uh, consisting of Dirac fermions uh, uh, away from high symmetry points in K space in the surface Brillouin zone. And there are in total four of these Dirac points. Um, because of the topological protection comes from uh, crystal symmetry. So if there is a crystal uh, structural spontaneous distortion, for example, if you have the ferroelectric distortion, then uh, the direct fermions can acquire a gap. So the, the massless to massive, okay? So indeed in photo emission uh, experiments and in STM experiments, uh, you can see that uh, the direct mass is present. Uh, and uh, this is an um, experiment from VDM at Haven's group. Uh, so, you know, basically you can think of this as a energy momentum dispersion measured by quasi particle interference experiments. And you see that in addition to the uh, direct point, there is a state uh, at a finite uh, energy gap, okay, away from direct points. Basically, uh, our understanding is that uh, there's a distortion along one particular direction. So that breaks one set of mirror symmetries, but preserve the other. So that leads to two of the direct fermions acquire mass, the other two does not. And also, if you look at this um, direct energy dispersion, uh, it is tilted 
right? It has an asymmetry. So it satisfies all the uh, ingredients I just said earlier. So that's why uh, in this 2015 paper, uh, motivated by this topological uh, crystalline insurers, we uh, proposed this tilted Dirac fermion uh, model for the nonlinear Hall effect. And uh, uh, the, just earlier this year, uh, this uh, experiment came out uh, from Japan. And, uh, uh, and again, uh, at room temperature, they observed this uh, nonlinear Hall effect. It shows up in Latin terawatt, which, which is in the topological regime. Uh, but it's uh, clearly absent in lead terawatt, which is known to be non-topological, right? Moreover, um, the, um, the sign of the Hall voltage switches uh, uh, when we change the ferroelectric uh, distortion. So by applying an electric pulse, one can switch the direction of the ferroelectric uh, polarization, uh, the ferroelectric uh, uh, crystal uh, polar axis. And as the polar axis changes, the transverse voltage also uh, changes sign. So this actually leads uh, to these authors to propose uh, some kind of a, a, a memory device. Uh, if you uh, basically um, the information can be stored in the polarity of the of the crystal, and uh, this information can be um, read out by measuring this transverse voltage through the nonlinear Hall effect, and uh, the classical bit can be switched. Uh, by applying an electric pulse. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just in the last uh, five minutes, let me briefly mention uh, some, some future directions. So um, so far I've shown you uh, the experiments uh, detecting this nonlinear Hall effect at uh, DC or at the low uh, frequency, but the back to the original motivation, uh, this uh, we believe it should work at much higher frequencies in the RF and in the even the terahertz range. So in particular, uh, you know, the DC, you know, this, this nonlinear Hall effect can convert an AC input signal into a DC and output, and therefore it can be used uh, as a photo detector, right? A photo detector. And uh, um, it works without any applied external bias, and it could uh, be uh, very sensitive. Uh, also, uh, because there, it doesn't involve any PN junctions, uh, it could, it's unlimited by this cutoff uh, frequency. So it could work in a very broad frequency range, uh, and uh, um, and uh, and uh, also may work at the room temperature. Um, so, um, so there are some very recent uh, experimental attempts in this direction. Uh, so this is an experiment from China uh, in cobalt terawatt. It's a, again a topological sand metal with uh, surface states that that breaks inversion symmetry, and uh, uh, they um, following uh, our uh, suggesting uh, they made a device like this, the yellow regions are antennas, which uh, amplifies the electric field uh, in this uh, gap region. And uh, the cobalt terror is placed uh, you know, at the gap between the, uh, in the antenna. And then they measure the current in the transverse direction, the photo current in the transverse direction. And uh, these are the uh, experimental uh, result. And you see that first, the uh, response is much larger in the transverse direction than in the longitudinal direction. Yeah, so I do you can change the polarization of the of light, and uh, um, and also uh, you see that uh, uh, this response remains large even uh, to, goes to about 0.1 terahertz. Right. So so um, so this is consistent at least uh, with uh, being uh, having an intrinsic uh, response. Uh, so let me just briefly mention that we also considered recently with my student uh, Yugo Onishi uh, the possibility of harvesting uh, energy. Uh, from the AC uh, electric field from electromagnetic radiation uh, using this nonlinear Hall uh, effect. And uh, um, uh, basically um, because of the, the Hall response, the Hall current is perpendicular to applied electric field. So by itself, the Hall effect does not create this dissipation. So um, basically we find that if the Hall nonlinear Hall angle is, is large, then this uh, energy conversion efficiency from AC to DC uh, can be uh, rich on the order of a few tens of percent. So this, this could be useful for, for harvesting a small amount of, uh, of uh, uh, energy. So, um, so let me just uh, uh, end here. Uh, basically this uh, diodic quantum materials, uh, you know, I think it uh, uh, could uh, connect to many different branches of, uh, of dense matter physics and, uh, and also material science. So um, it relies on uh, the quantum mechanics in a crucial way. Rely on uh, quantum geometry of electrons in the crystals, 
and uh, uh, large barrier curvature is often found in uh, topological materials. Uh, and uh, in the normal state, uh, non supernatting state, uh, I've just shown that the nonlinear Hall effect uh, as a prominent example of uh, non reciprocal transport with large uh, non reciprocity. Uh, and uh, this uh, requires uh, crystals that break inversion symmetry. And uh, this could come from, for example, ferroelectric distortion. And also, there's a lot of uh, interest uh, recently uh, in magnetic materials. The crystal structure is inversion symmetric, but magnetism can break the inversion. Uh, also, um, in superconductors with, with a polar uh, crystal structure under external magnetic field, we can get a superconducting diode effect. Uh, also, in the superconducting fluctuation regime, uh, this, this could be quite, uh, quite interesting. And uh, it also connects naturally to nonlinear optics. Uh, high frequency electronics and uh, and they may have may have uh, interesting applications so um so uh, and uh, before ending let me uh, uh thank my uh, collaborators uh so i've been i've been very lucky to work with uh, several generations of uh, postdocs and students at mit uh, we also benefit enormously from collaborating with experimentalists so the uh the experiment uh, on Thompson Dieterowide, the first experiment reporting the nonlinear Hall effect was led by uh, two uh, postdocs at that time, uh, Chong Ma and uh, Su Yang Xu. Uh, now they are both uh, professors uh, in the Boston area. Uh, and uh, uh, the work on niobium phosphorus is uh, done in collaboration with Professor Zhi Chang Mao and his student Lu Jingming in Penn State University. And the supernatting diode effect, we uh, collaborated with Jagdish Modera at MIT and also with Stuart Parking. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you. All right, Qu questions, please. If somebody wants. Yeah. Uh, questions, guys. No? Yeah. Yeah. Lang, thank you for the fantastic talk. On your final applications slide, yeah. uh, in addition to terahertz sensing was infrared sensing on there. And uh, most of what you explored in the context of nonlinear Hall effects was sort of an intraband, if I understand, right. nonlinear right. Hall effect. Absolutely. Can you comment on... Uh, the interband possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For example, in these gap systems, which sets a certain energy scale. Right, right, right. Absolutely. So, yes, this is a great question. So, um, I, I should mention that there's a a, a, a vast literature on uh, photo galvanic effect from interband uh, conditions. Uh, this goes on the name of, uh, example, shift current, uh, also a circular photo galvanic effect. Right. And uh, there's many studies by people like Joe Moore and Orange King and, and also others. Uh, and uh, um, you know that, as you said, uh, you know um, that is very um, could be very promising for um, optical detection, detecting uh, optical photons, uh, or uh, even infrared photons. Uh, but it's very difficult to use interband transition to detect terahertz frequency because the terahertz energy, photon energy is very small. It's only order of you know, only milli eV or even less. Right? So basically, I think this intraband mechanism uh, has an opportunity. Uh, you know, for photo detection at a uh, far infrared uh, frequency range. Yeah. So it sort of fills a, a, a gap yeah. with existing technology. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful talk. So I want to ask about um, when you mentioned the anomalous um, hole effect. <clears throat> you show the um, um, tilted direct gap uh, band structure in the material. It looks very much the same as like uh, a non-direct band gap structure in, in, in materials. So do I understand correctly that this is just um, something looks like a non-direct band gap with a non-zero barrier curvature? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, uh, the particular model is just to uh, illustrate where barrier dipole can arise. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, uh, you know, in order to uh, get barrier curvature, one need a minimum of a two-band system, right? 
Right. A single band, you know, it's not enough to capture better curvature. So uh, there's this tilted massive Dirac fermion uh, model is perhaps just a simplest example of a of a two band system that give rise to better curvature type. But you're absolutely right that uh, you know there's nothing very special, right, uh, mm -hmm. with better curvature type. You know, it should generically exist in materials with uh, the inversion symmetry breaking uh, crystal structure. Yeah. So the question is more about quantitative. Like in what kind of materials can we get large barrier diving? Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Lianka, I'm embarrassed yeah. to ask the question. It's about the beginning of your talk, about yes. full differential Larkin of Chinico stuff. Yes. Uh, you need a solution which is E to IQR All right. as opposed to Cassin. Yeah. And if you do standard, it's called weak coupling calculations. Right. I think it's Cassin that wins, Cassine right? Wins. Yeah. I, I'm... So do you need to do something special to get this? Right. So I'm, you know, taking just a phenomenological approach that uh, assuming that this one, for whatever reason, this could be stabilized. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I'm aware that if you uh, do the weak coupling approach, it's the first one that uh, actually wins. Uh, so one thing that I've been mean, just thinking a little bit, and again, nothing, nothing serious. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so it, could it be, for example, right, when you are uh, passing a current through a superconductor, right? So in other words, we ask, you know, which kind of superconducting state can carry a larger vertical current? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's possible that maybe this uh, this single momentum state can win. Yeah, I think that's just some speculation. Okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, yeah. But also my understanding that the energetics between these two states can be very close. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah. All right, any more questions? Yes, please. Uh, uh, could you comment on a possible mechanism that could make superconducting diodes without a magnetic field? Like, is that possible or is it prohibited by like some fundamental law? Uh, it's certainly possible. You know, the, in this finite momentum pairing state, right? If we can find a finite momentum superconductor uh, with an order parameter that has a you know, sort of spatial dependent phase, Right. This then uh, breaks the time reversal symmetry, breaks inversion symmetry. So, so you should allow the superconducting diode. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's why uh, I think this superconducting diode that could be a, you know, a, a way to probe uh, unconventional superconductors, superconductors with unconventional order parameters. All right. Be before concluding, Claire, let me remind you that there is a uh, grad five receptions now at the third floor. So you're all invited to proceed to the third floor and have some refreshments. And let's thank Yang Fung.